Right, hey everyone, uh, I'm just going to do a bit of a welcome thing and kind of give you a bit of the sponsors and then I'll be introducing myself to talk, which is a little bit weird, I've not done that before. Um, we're going to turn it here, uh, great to see so many new faces. If there's anybody here who hasn't like, signed up on the meetup.com site, just you know, click the, I think there's a join membership thing so you get any notifications of any new talks coming up. Um, we also have a Slack channel. If anybody doesn't know what Slack is, uh, just chat to somebody else. It's a really cool chat app. Um, and we have some interesting conversations on there uh, every so often. Uh, I just have to invite you in, so you just give me an email and just grab me afterwards and I'll, I'll throw you on the Slack channel. Um, right, so just a quick word about our sponsors. We have three sponsors. Uh, our first is Sarah Ashford, who is a tech recruiter. Um, we also have uh, my company, Bluey, uh, and a, uh, I don't think we have somebody from Frog here today, uh, but Frog Education, a BLE uh, company based in Halifax. Um, if we, we do have quite a lot of new people here, so this won't mean anything to you, but if anybody has any uh, challenges for Chris's talk last month, which was about push, notifications. Just grab me after the talk and we'll probably just do them up here on this big bench. Uh, I'll tell you what the challenges are at the end of the, uh, the my talk. Um, uh, our next two talks coming up in October, we have Yusuf, who just walked in not so long ago, there he is, uh, giving us a talk about the Ionic framework. And then we will have Thiru giving us a talk on notebots and various hardware related things. Yeah. We're going to have more details about those up on meetup.com in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, right, and without further ado, I'll get us started. Right, I'm going to thank you again for coming. This is a bit strange. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a, I like talking about Ember stuff. I do it every moment that I get a chance to. So I feel good that I can do this here tonight. And I think it's just a perfect time to do it because we just had the release of Ember 2.0 last month. So I can justify it. This will probably be my last chance doing it ever again. Um, right. So a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm a bit of the Ember guy. Uh, I am a little bit of a fanatic. So it's just one of the things that you kind of get used to <laughs> over time knowing me. Um, I've been running this startup, this chat startup, for the last four years called Bluey. And we use Ember and JavaScript all the way down to the stack. So I'm, I'm deep into this stuff a lot of the time. Um, we've just recently started doing some consulting work as well, which, if you haven't experienced doing consulting, it's not what you expect it to be. It's a lot harder to do, dealing with clients and things like that. But it's uh, fun, good stuff. And, We've been doing some Ember apps, some really cool Ember apps for some cool uh, companies recently, so that's kind of cool. So, why am I so crazy about Ember? Um, let's first of all see who knows who's used Ember, who's like used Ember in the past, even just for like personal projects. Anybody? Two, maybe two and a half. Yeah. Anybody used? Oh, another one. Anybody actually used Ember in production for their work? No. Sort of. Getting there. Yeah. But th this is something that's always been quite interesting to me. I've never really understood it. Obviously, I've got a different perspective being so mad about it. But I've always felt like Ember was a bit of an ugly sister of the JavaScript frameworks. You've got Angular, which is the big Google uh, framework, and everybody knows about it. And if you look at any of those graphs of Angular JS jobs, you know, up and to the right, as they say in San Francisco. Um, and now you've got things like React coming out and kind of getting a lot of the hype train behind them. But you don't have a lot of people talking about Ember. Uh, you, you hear the guys in the core team talking about this and how Ember avoids the hype train. But it's hard for me to kind of explain why somebody should use Ember over the other two. Um, one, of, one of the things that's kind of the big selling factor for me is the community community itself. Um, this, is a, this is actually on the Ember.js website. They've got a, 
a video of all the different Ember communities, all the different Ember meetups around the world saying hello. Uh, how, do they, how do they put it? Uh, set to inspiring music, just because. So it's, it's fun to watch, but it's, uh, it's interesting to see how, how connected these communities can be. And it's not just about you know, people hanging out and having meetups and saying, oh, Ember's great. It's also the benefit of the community to Ember itself is the process how Ember kind of improves itself over time because of the community and not just kind of having one company kind of controlling everything in Ember and deciding what everybody and how everybody should use it. Um, it also gives you this air of, you know, the right way to do things. You get, you get a lot of this in, in the Ruby world where, you know, DHH is the, the, the uh, the main guy in Ruby, and if he says you should or should not be doing something, that's what people do. It's not necessarily just as kind of a single person orientated in Ember, but it does have that same sort of feeling. If the community starts doing things in a different way, people tend to follow, and it's good as a kind of a best practices signpost. Um, it's interesting because when I started getting into Ember, uh, I was a terrible JavaScript programmer. I've been doing Kooks too, which is terrible if anybody's ever used it, it does not prepare you for the world of web programming. But I knew that I was a bad JavaScript programmer. I, I came from a C++ background and I've done a lot of QT development, which is a model view controller C++ thing that KDE uses. Very few people actually know about QT, but it, it existed and it was good. But I knew that there was a better way to do things. Um, and I didn't feel like there was that sort of thing in the, uh, the jQueries or the backbones of the JavaScript and web programming world. There wasn't a way for me to follow. There wasn't like a community to kind of embed myself into until I essentially found Ember. I did try Angular briefly for about a month and then jumped ship. So I have been an Angular guy very, very briefly. Um, right, so I'm going to stop talking about the community for a second. But there is a method to my madness. Like what, why am I really talking about this in terms of community? Ember 2.0 is an interesting kind of release. It wasn't like what you would normally see with uh, code projects and things like that. It, it, it's, it's even weird to kind of describe it as when it, when it was released. You know, I said that Ember 2.0 was released last month. But actually it started in November 2014. Um, it was part of the process that things were being improved on in Ember, uh, the RFC process. I'll, I'll go into that in more detail, but I'm, I'm going to break one of the canonical rules of doing presentations like this and read something off the slide. Um, but this is important, so I'm going to do it. So Ember 2.0 is not a traditional major release. We're focusing on sweeping out built up Cruft as a foundation for continuing progress. Ember, Ember 2.0 only removes features that were deprecated as of Ember 1.13. So apps that run without any deprecations, that any deprecation warnings should run without issues on Ember 2.0. So there's a lot in there, and I'll go into more detail about that later. Um, you'll notice I've redacted a few things just because I wanted it to sound less like a sales pitch and a uh, um, press release. Uh, it sounded much more like that on the actual uh, release uh, documentation. Um, this thing about deprecations is kind of the key point for us. Anything that was released as part of Ember 2.0 didn't come all at once. It came over time. So you could start using Ember 2.0 way before it actually released as one single release. So this is a bit of the timeline of Ember itself. Um, 1.0 came out in God, January, maybe February 2011? No, uh, 2012. So it's been a very long time ago. Um, we have this Ember 2.0 announcement uh, in November 2014. But after that, we had a whole bunch of releases. 
where each of the features that they announced they were going to include in Ember 2.0 was released bit by bit in each of these minor releases. Um, uh, you can forgive me for not knowing exactly every single one of the features that went in each one of these, but I think we had HTML bars, which I'll explain a little bit more in the, in later, come in uh, 110, and then we had our Glimmer rendering engine, which is essentially just copying off uh, React come in 1.13. Um, so we had things kind of trickling in. And it was, it was good because it wasn't just one of these things where you could use Ember 2.0 before it was ready. It allowed us to release things. I say us as if I'm part of the core team. The core team and the community to release things bit by bit. And then have reactions from people actually using this in live code, in production which makes a huge difference. There was, there was some things that were, were announced in Ember uh, 2.0 in the, in the ORFC, which I'll go into in a little minute, um, that we didn't actually get in Ember 2.0. Some of the big parts of it, we decided against it because it was huge architectural changes that actually it wasn't the right time for it. So we wouldn't have gotten that sort of knowledge if we had just released it and then gone, yeah, that's shit. Yeah, it's too late. We've broken everybody's app, and now they have to rewrite it, and now they're going to go, this is a terrible framework, and move to something else. Um, so there's, there's benefits of doing it this way. So I've said RFC a few times. Does everybody know what RFC actually stands for? Does anybody know? No? Because, ah, we've got somebody. There we go. Somebody said it. Because I didn't know it until like earlier today, I've been working with RFCs with Ember for so long and like, you know, in the, the um, HTTP protocol RFCs and all that sort of stuff. But I never knew that it stood for a request for comment. But that in itself is kind of a really powerful idea. All the RFCs, so all of the big ideas that Ember wants to implement over time are published on that GitHub uh, repo as pull requests. So if you want to add a big uh, feature to Ember, all you need to do is uh, fork that repo, write a markdown file describing some of the pros and cons of your feature that you want to add to Ember, submit it as a pull request. And then you'll have a bunch of people saying, you know, starting the conversations and, and essentially trying to, well, in, in a lot of cases, pick apart whether or not it's a good idea, but in other cases, working with you. And some people will say, this, this is just the first part of the process. You then have a second part of the process that actually implements it into Ember. So some people come up with the ideas and other people sometimes implement it or try to implement it. So if you really wanted to get involved in Ember development, it would be really good to get into this repo and read through it. And, kind of see what's out there. And also gives you an idea of what's coming in Ember. Right, so this is, that, that's one of the things that, you know, when I started this talk, I really was starting in terms of community and process. But that is a really good realization of that community. It's a good expression of how the community helps each other and comes up with ideas, but doesn't just throw things over the wall which is what you tend to get a lot of times when you're working with other frameworks that are built in-house with a big company. They will implement what they want and they need in production, and sometimes they'll get some feedback from third parties. But it's not a, right, let's write a document saying what we want to implement. See if people think that's a good idea, then start implementing it. It's always the other way around. They implement it, and then they ask, oh, is this a good idea? And then you start building up corrupt and terribleness in the, in the actual code itself. So, the URFC. I said that Ember 2.0 was announced in November 2014. It was announced as a URFC. Tom Dale wrote a pull request, probably, with the... Actually, I think he says, uh, as a result of two of the core team meetings. Um, so it was the core team together, but Tom Dale wrote it ultimately. He wrote out a really in-depth proposal for how we want to see Ember progressing. Like, 
it's <laughs> it's a big uh, it's a big document. It's four thousand words, and afterwards you had two hundred and fifty three comments. I, w I would really recommend anybody going and actually having a, a read of this. It is great to see how much thought and in depth investigation these people did to see what how they wanted to progress a framework like this. And it's really great to see the comments and, and see how the conversations went. And, and, and it actually links off to other RFCs. The main 2.0 um, RFC itself was just essentially like a, not quite, but like a, a meta issue. And each of the things they wanted to do were RFCs in their own right. So not only were they giving this huge directional uh, document on where they wanted to bring Ember, they then allowed people to get into the nitty gritty on how it's going to work. And I've seen it so many times that people are, I would say arguing, but maybe discussing, constructively discussing the, the minute syntax, should it be this way around or that way around, and all this sort of stuff. But it makes a difference. And actually asking this before you implement it is really powerful as a community project. Right. So, in that big RFC, there were a few key points. Um, I'm, from the rest of this uh, talk, I'm taking a lot of influence from uh, a talk that Robert Jackson gave back in November uh, 2014. Um, it was kind of the time when the core team were out uh, kind of promoting what was happening in Ember 2.0. So he was giving a glimpse, and I, I can't remember, but I think he did some code samples and I can't remember if it was live coding. But, um, it was in the Boston, Boston Ember uh, meetup. Um, I'm essentially taking a lot of influence from his talk, but the difference is that I am seeing it, essentially I'm seeing it from the future in his perspective. I can look back and see what things did and didn't make it into the, uh, the framework. Um, and I've also added a few things that he didn't touch on because as the process was rolling on, as we went from Ember 1.8 to Ember 1.13, we added a few things in that were more about the process, about the, the community itself, instead of just the code. Um, if, <laughs> yeah, so each of these things made it themselves into Ember over those releases. If I, if I had more time and I was a better historian, I probably would have said, oh, that one made it into uh, 1.9 or 1.10 or whatever, but uh, yeah. So, the first of those points, a strong focus on migration. If you do get around to reading that RFC, which I do recommend, they talk about it in terms of not wanting to break anybody's project. They don't want, they don't want people to be left in the lurch and having to rewrite entire large apps without having any kind of help. Um, they do mention that in the RFC, and Robert Jackson mentions it in his talk as well. But I've kind of, as the, as the release process has kind of gone on, they added extra things that weren't there. That they weren't expecting, well, I assume they weren't expecting at the time. Um, this whole, you know, started off the, the, the talk as it being a, a, a featureless release, I think I'll put it on meetup.com, and it's, the, the 2.0 is not adding any features, it's just removing the craft. That, that in itself is a real good sign that they were trying to think of it in terms of uh, allowing a good migration process. If you're not adding new, uh, new features in 2.0, it's not going to break things here. Um, there, there were other things they added since. So I've mentioned it a few times, this idea of deprecations. Um, I, I assume everybody knows what deprecations means. A lot of nods in there. So essentially, when, what it looks like in Ember when you've got a bunch of deprecations is you're, you're running your app in development mode. They don't show in production just because it would be a bit messy. And you get all of these warnings in the console that say, oh, you're using a deprecated feature. So they had planned to have these deprecations, and we see it in the original RFC, but they didn't quite plan to, well, at least I don't think so, they didn't expect it to get such of a big deal about it. They, there were many different releases where they improved how the deprecation system worked. They 
included you know, IDs so that you can go and, and check what your deprecation was against a defined list of deprecations in the Ember docs so that you could see what exactly you needed to do to upgrade. They, um, in, like, even the message that you get in a deprecation, it's a huge chunk of thing with the console. It describes exactly what you need to do. It just doesn't, it doesn't tell you that there's a problem. It tells you how to fix it, which is one of the best kind of warnings you can get. And on top of that, they added this um, system. Well, they added two things. They, they made this Ember add-on called Ember Watson, which goes through your code, and any of the, uh, any of the deprecations that are just semantic changes, and I'll show a few of those in a second, it changes them for you. And essentially, you run Ember Watson for one of the deprecations. You then create a PR, and you've got all of the different code things that need to change. Those just subtle. You know, some of the structural things they're not able to do, but they extended Ember Watson over time, so they were able to make better improvements to it. And that really helps, especially when you've got a large app. And Ember, don't forget, is about building, uh, how do they call it, ambitious web applications. If you've got a massive app, you don't want to be going through every line of your templates and changing the, the format of an each from one way to like just essentially reversed. It's just, oh, that would take forever. Another thing that they did was they extended Ember Inspector. Does everybody know what Ember Inspector is? No, so I'm not sure who did it first. You know, being an Ember guy, I, I obviously think, oh, it's definitely Ember who did it first. Um, we're now seeing this trend for the big framework people to come out with essentially Chrome plugins or Firefox plugins. They give you an extra tab on like the debugger console to let you get into some of the nitty gritty things about the framework. Ember has one that lets you go and see Ember data objects and things like that. And even, if I remember correctly, it allows you to see active promises at any one time. So if you've got a promise that hasn't returned, you can have a look and see which promises are failing. It even has like a, a rendering pipeline a timing system so you can see which of your pages are taking ages to render. But they came out with this deprecation uh, tab in this Ember Inspector, which essentially gives you, not only just checks the ID and all this sort of stuff, it gives you a full collection of all of the deprecations that you have encountered while running your app. So if you start your app and just do a, you know, a acceptance test or something like that, by the end of it, you'll have a list of all the deprecations that you hit while you're doing that, which is awesome. But these are the sorts of things that if you don't have them at the beginning of this, of upgrading to something like Ember 2.0 or through the different versions, it's not that it's impossible, but it's one of those things that it becomes a, becomes a decision from your project manager. Oh, are we going to bother doing that? Is it, is it worth a while to upgrade? But if it's all done automatically for you, if you've got everything listed out perfectly for you, it's a matter of like a half a day, a day, to upgrade a massive app. Trust me, I know, we've upgraded so many times. We have got way too many lines of code. Um, which really makes a difference. And again, this is a community effort. Um, right. So that was the strong focus on, um, how do I phrase it? on migration. Now, another thing that was quite important in the Ember 2.0 cycle was Ember CLI and open standards. Ember CLI, I think I did a talk here, maybe, maybe it was still Node of North at the time, um, but I did a talk on Ember CLI. And I think it might have just been Ember, but I was using Ember CLI at the time. And it's really quite a cool system. It's, it's like a generator system, if anybody's used Yeoman before. It's like your own personal Yeoman that allows you to generate different parts of the app, which you can just do Ember new, builds a new app, just like the kind of Rails, um, what do they call it bootstrap? Not Rails guy, no, <laughs> Rails guy. Um, but it allows you to get started really quick. But Ember so the CLI has an extra few tricks on, on the sleeve. Um, obviously. The, it actually builds the system for you. So Ember CLI isn't just a generator, it, it replaces Grunt or, um, what's the other one? Gulp. 
uh, and it, it's actually using neither. It's using something called broccoli, which is another story in its own great system. Um, but it's it, it does the whole thing for you. It it does. You're you're watching your builds. It builds SAS files for you. Restarts your browser when something's changed. It does incremental builds, so it's not taking you like ten seconds for something to refresh. It does everything for you. And not only that, you don't have to set it up. That's a community effort. And the thing that happened in Ember 2.0 is it became a first-class citizen. It wasn't just a you know, skunk works for some of the community saying, oh, we don't want to use Grunt anymore, we want to use this. Uh, I can't remember exactly the date or which release it, it became a first-class citizen. But now, when you go onto emberjs.com, the first thing that you see is download and install Ember CLI, run uh, Ember New, and then the name of your app. And you start it. And having that as an onboarding process for new users is just so powerful. Not only that, Ember CLI gives you extra things. It gives you add-ons, which is a brilliant idea. You, if you've ever seen any of my Ember apps, I tend to just use something called Ember Paper, which instantly gives you material design layout in uh, native Ember components, which is great. Which means I don't have to worry about any of the design. Somebody else has done that for me. Somebody in the community has done that for me. Um, I've tried to, com to contribute to Ember Paper, but my two PRs have both been rejected. I'm not a designer. <laughs> um, there's, there's another uh, plugin that we use in, in Bluey called uh, Auto Prefixer. Is there any designers in the uh, house? They would know what that means more than I do. My understanding is that it gives uh, browser-specific prefixes to CSS uh, rules. Cool, I've got some nods happening, that's good. <laughs> so uh, I think we might have contributed that in Bluey um, because it was one of those things where somebody else wrote the, the actual prefixer, but we just put it into a Ember add-on because we need it. And that's the sort of community thing that we try to, you know, I'm, I'm part of this and I've forced our developers to do it. Uh, no. um, another thing that we did was Ember CLI notifications. So all these kind of pop up, I think we call it Atom style notifications. You can just do that with uh, a simple one line of code once you install an app, instead of having to build it all in yourself. And being able to add features like that on a piece by piece basis is really quite powerful. And it gets you from not to running really quite fast in Ember really quickly. Um, and the other thing here, so I say open standards, because not only does uh, Ember CLI give you all the awesome stuff that I've just said, it installs Babel by default, which means that out of the box, Ember, Ember apps using Ember CLI, which is the main way to run Ember apps now, get to use ES6, and get to use ES6 in a standard way that all browsers can support, which is awesome. And it, it, it's interesting because JavaScript is, you know, people have issues with JavaScript as a language, but ES6 really changes a lot of the game. Like, you get string interpolation, you get uh, arrow functions. Oh, God, arrow functions are awesome. If anybody knows anything about ES6, by the way, uh, we're looking to have somebody give a talk on it, just kind of a quick overview. So, if you're interested, come and have a chat with me after, the, after this. Right. So, hopefully you guys can see that. I'm going to get into the actual code. This is the first code that I've shown in this entire talk. So, out of the very few people who've actually seen Ember in the past, they probably would have used something along the top. Um, this was a little bit of a side effect of the fact that we were using handlebars up until uh, Ember 1.10. And handlebars, as you know, is a templating uh, language, but it only deals with strings. So what Ember did in their rendering engine was for us to be able to deal with uh, updates. So in this case here, you can see I'm using an isActive variable. So if isActive changed, you want the, in this case, class to update so that it actually updates the template. Now, if you 
if you were just thinking of it in terms of a uh, handlebar string, you just put class equals and then put a handlebar string is active or some sort of class name in there. But you can't do that because Ember used to put in these scripts tags to, to be able to go and find that same part of essentially the giant string that it was just throwing into the DOM. So they can update it. So we go and locate that particular script tag and update the contents of it. We can't have a script tag inside a class definition. So we have to do, do all these bending over backwards and, and have this bind atter thing, which works. It's great. But if, you don't, if you've never seen this before, it doesn't make sense to you. You know, the is active one probably you can get. If the is active is true, you'll have a class active. OK, that makes sense. Link. What's the colon there for? That's just a static class. If you want a static class when you're binding it like this, you have to do it that way. You have to put a colon before it. You wouldn't necessarily know that without being having it explained to you. And one of the things that we got out of HTML bars, so this is before Glimmer, which was the, the thing that we stole, uh, sorry, borrowed from uh, React, we were able to start doing things more like this, where you can have just a class equals a string, and then you add in things like if, so if is active, put in the active string there. So this boils down to a string, and it updates in real time. They were able to do that in um, in 1.10, but when Glimmer landed, we started using the virtual DOM, which means that we were able to use the same sort of speed that React was able to use. And this is all extremely fast, extremely fast, which is quite cool. Um, right, I'm going to move on to the next template update. Ah, there we are. So, right. So this one is a little bit of a strange example. This is what I was saying earlier on when I was talking about the Ember Watson thing. This one, you can very much just do automatically. You don't need to go through all this and manually change those because they are semantically exactly the same. You might look at this and say, why bother? What's the point? What's the point in changing it if it's not making any real difference? It doesn't make sense in this context, but when you see the next context, it will make sense. So instead of just having uh, access to the single to-do item, you have access to the other things that you would normally expect from like a for each. So this is the old way to do it, and actually. You're not able. I haven't put an example of the first of how to do this in the first one because you're not able to do it. You don't have the features available in the templating language to do this. You'd have to do horrible things with controllers and item controllers and all this sort of stuff just so you can have account like this. Whereas, just like in for each, you have the three parameters: the item itself, the index, and then the list itself. You can do this each to-dos as to-do index list. Very simple. And it makes sense when you look at that. And when, when you don't know Ember and you're going in, starting a new job for the first time, look at that. You know what you need to change if you want to update it. It's one of these things that well, the reason they say Ember is for building ambitious web applications is because it's, it's focusing on allowing developers to come to these things easily and actually be productive really quickly. All right, so let's move on. So there's another thing. Again, this is, these are a, a little bit of the intricacies of things that if you have used Ember in the past, you will have come across these. Everybody will have come across these. I think this example was something that was in the guides very early on as the way that you want to loop over lots of to-dos. Now, looking at this, you're going, uh, what? Where did that title come from? Actually, what's happening here is that, as we saw before in the, in the previous one, we had each to-do in to-dos. So it's looping through each particular to-do item. Here, it doesn't give you the to-do item as a object that you get the title from. It assigns it to this inside that context. So you've just, if you do it this way, you've just lost context for anything outside of that. So you can't include anything else. We can 
easy to do. And this was so problematic to explain to new Ember developers that in 2.0, they removed it. You just can't do it. You have to use the other syntax because it explains what it's doing. And it was not worth having a convenience thing in Ember that people weren't able to use or explain. And that, that kind of was, again, illustrating the concepts of what Ember is trying to get across. Right, so components. If you read the RFC itself, there's this whole massive section about components. Massive. And it really goes into how components are going to work. Um, <laughs> we, we didn't quite get to everything. We got this thing called improved actions. I haven't put an explanation in here because it is a little bit of a weird situation. The only thing that I'm going to say about improved actions is that it's really about allowing you to connect components together and, and have actions bubble. So actions are just what Ember people call events. Actions bubble through different components and, and get the right kind of context. So the benefit of them is, is a little bit weird to explain. If anybody's interested, come and catch me afterwards and I'll show you a really good example of that. Um, we also had this idea of one-way bindings, which is something that uh, React really pushes as a concept. Um, we have it now, and we, we have this idea of what we call data down actions up, which is now a, a term that the community has come up with to explain this concept. And it's an interesting point here. I had no idea if that came from Ember or if that came from React. When I say community, I mean the wider JavaScript community. And that's one of the things that I really love about Ember. The, the, the outside walls are open. If you've got good ideas, you know, we'll use them. And it doesn't matter who came up with this idea of data down actions up. It's a good idea and we're running it. So now, if somebody is asking me a question about, oh, should I, should I have a mutable uh, bound property or something in a template? Horrible idea, usually has problems. I can use a term that's very succinct that not only expresses what you're trying to do, it gives you a hint on how to do it. Instead of thinking of it in terms of, oh, changing a value that's bound, you think of it in terms of, oh, if it's bound, that's putting it into the component. And if you want it out, use an action. Great kind of a concept. And the last thing that was in the RFC was this idea of mutable components. I'm not going to go into that in detail because this is about Ember 2.0 and it didn't make it. Um, it's, it's interesting to kind of think about it not making it into Ember 2.0 because it, essentially one of the things that the guys in Ember did was they put a time limit on when 2.0 would be released or at least the, the, the beta would be released. And part of the release cycle is that every six weeks you have a new major release. So when the, the um, 113, oh, no, that's not right. When 113 was released, 2.0 beta was released. And then there's six weeks to get that stable and release as 2.0 stable. I think that's right, if it's not, Check the uh, Ember website. They have a, a really good diagram of explaining all the different beta releases that they do over time. It's really it's an interesting system. I think it's like a rolling release train, something that other people have been using. Um, I don't. I've not come across something like it before. Um, but the fact that rootable components actually didn't make it is a yeah. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Actually, I'm jumping ahead in a second. So, one of the other main points of the RFC was that they wanted to simplify uh, concepts. I've, I've mentioned that already in things like the template. We wanted to remove concepts that didn't work for explaining to more people. I also hinted at it when I said you can't do a particular feature in the old way of doing a template. You have to use controllers. Not only do you have to use controllers, you might have to use object controllers, array controllers, all these weird different esoteric types of controllers. In Ember 2.0, most, <laughs> most controllers are deprecated. The only one that isn't deprecated is one that's, um, is the main controller itself. And the reason why that's not 
deprecated is because we need to solve the rootable uh, components thing before we can remove the last controller because we need to figure out how actions are actually bubbling towards things. But if anybody ever says, oh, you should use an array controller or something weird that you've never heard of like that, the answer is use a component there because that's the way that we want to see Ember develop. All of the things that you want to do should be put in a component if they're just outside of what the template which you can do itself. Uh, which is really quite powerful and it's a useful thing when you're building, like I said, uh, uh, I've lost the word now, but bigger Ember applications. Right. So, um, just to kind of divert off Ember 2.0 itself, so because uh, rootable components didn't actually make it into the 2.0 major release, um, the Ember community, I think uh, Yehuda Katz wrote this particular uh, RFC. They, they come up with a kind of a, a plan B so that we can get something as big and as breaking change as rootable components in the same way as we got a big 2.0 release without having people to go through the same sort of pain. So improving the process in itself. So during the process of releasing 2.0, they came up with an even better process for any future major releases. And they came up with this thing called, um, I would call them point releases, but they like to call them LTS, long-term support releases. So between 2.0 and a fictional 3.0, that hasn't, there's no talk about yet, now there's going to be maybe every four minor releases, it's going to be a long-term support. And at every long-term support, you're going to be able to, um, essentially, if you start on Ember 2.0 today, you never upgrade. And you then suddenly want to upgrade to Ember uh, 2.12 in the future when that happens, if that happens, I suppose. Um, you would, instead of having to upgrade all at once and do all of the deprecations and all these things, all at the same time, you could release to each of the long-term support releases, and they're going to support updating between 2.0, 2.4, 2.8, 2.12, and if there's any breaking from that, they're going to fix it in both fix releases. Not only that, they've come up with this idea of a spelt release, so this whole idea of just removing um, cruft code from Ember in the 2.0 release. They're going to be able to do that with each of the long-term support releases by just essentially opting in to a spelt release, which just means, in the same way as Ember 2.0, if you are running with no deprecations, it will work with the spelt release. Which is interesting. I, I really like that. And that's, you know, <laughs> you've got your work cut out if you are going to read the, uh, the Ember 2.0 RFC. So I won't suggest that you read the the updating one as well, that's a, a little bit too much. So uh, again, I, I won't bang the idea home, but this is one of the things that I really like about the Ember community, and one of the real um, examples of working quite well, because during the 2.0 release, there was a bit of pain around upgrading to 1.13, because we had a new rendering pipeline uh, release and actually some things there were there are quite a lot of deprecations. So even though it didn't break anything or it didn't break much, you still had to do a lot before you could upgrade to point out. So people were saying, look, that was too painful, let's not do that again. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna do this LTS releases. So you can see how the even in the last kind of year they've improved the process even better. Right. And uh, that is it. I know a lot of that was a bit of a meta discussion on how the Ember community works with the code itself. Um, I didn't want to go into too much depth in the code, um, mainly because a lot of people haven't used it and I didn't want it to just be slides of code that nobody's ever seen before. Um, I will open the uh, floor up for questions now, but as I promised, I was going to explain what the uh, challenges are. 
every month we try to have a challenge for all of our uh, members so that if you uh, partake, and if, yeah, essentially it's like a voting by mob, so whoever cheers the loudest, that's the person who wins. When you win, you get like a prize. Um, we've got a few swag bags which actually Luke has at the moment. Uh, might be able to give away some of the uh, swag that Theory got us for, uh, from uh, Palmer in London um, for this month's one. Um, but essentially, each, each speaker has to give out the challenge. And my challenge for everybody here, so that if I ask the room again, has anybody ever used Ember? I want to see every single hand go, you know, all I want is somebody to use all to download Ember CLI and run the steps. That is Ember New, playing for app, Ember Start, and we've got an app running. That's it. That's all I want. That's to succeed in doing the challenge, but if you want to win, you probably have to make an LED flash. Because <laughs> that's what people do. The things they've done. <laughs> um, so, Essentially, I don't want one of these like massive, ambitious, that's the word I was looking for. I don't want an overly ambitious Ember app. I want something cool, something simple. But it has to use some plugins, add-ons. So if you're using add-ons, you get extra points. OK? Right? Does anybody have any questions? Vincent. Hi. Uh, how does how it? Deal with things that, like, does everything have to be an anox? So you're not, are you using npm things like that, or is it just all within Ember? I say we were doing something with React or something, and we just go, right, I want to be able to, I don't know, get a route or something like that. I guess that's a bit too specific. Uh, use a library, for example. Can can you do code that's going to be just out of Ember's scope and bring it in, or does it have to be within the scope of Ember? So everything that's like specific like that, someone's had to have built and create, do they call them components? Is that yeah, um, add-ons. Add-ons, yeah. So does everything have to be an add-on before it can be used within Ember? So just to reiterate the question for anybody who didn't hear it, um, does everything have to be an add-on before you can actually use it in Ember? Um, not really. You can just. Like in the same way, you've got an index file, you can just add a JavaScript file, and then you've got things on the um, the global scope. Like we we've used Moment in that way in some of our apps, but it can be better to use it if there is an add. -on. So there is now Ember Moment. Uh, there was two. There was a shim, which is essentially somebody just taking it and wrapping it into an, uh, as you say, a proper Ember context, so that you can work with it in the Ember way. Um, and they make it useful, but if you do it right, the second moment, uh, um, you're actually able to import it as a ES6 module. So that way you're able to control which different um, files or modules, I think they are modules in the own right, has access to that context. So one of the things that you have a problem, and I know we're kind of working around it and we're not stepping on anybody's toes, but if you ever do come across a name clash in a global scope, you don't have that if you're doing ES6 modules. So there are benefits to using the, the Ember add-on style of third-party modules. And they're very easy to make as well. Um, you, you mentioned as well by pulling in a root. You can actually have roots out of an add-on. So lots of different code of your own can be out in your own kind of app. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with that. So you're able to like import like you're doing ES6 or so like import from Yes, yeah, so you import sort of moment kind of from of Ember moment and then you've got moment in your Oh okay. Text. So yeah, so but to bring external stuff it's preferable for it to be Ember then. It it's preferable from a from you using the perspective. Yes. There's there's nothing there's <laughs> Nobody in the community would whip you for using a non-Ember add-on, you know. And, and just to kind of extend your question as well, I think you asked it in passing, we, most Ember add-ons are NPM modules, but there are other ones that also need power components. Yeah. Oh, God. Do you have like a package? You have a package JSON for every Ember app. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
So oh. this, you, even just Ember itself is comes in NPM modules and stuff like that, and lots of different bits and pieces. Of it. So if you if you do the challenge for next month, uh, just look at your package JSON after doing a simple Ember new. It's huge. It's got lots of different things because each of the different Ember parts. It's not just like Ember 2.0. Bam. It's Ember application, Ember version manager, all, all these different things are all split out. It's really cool to have a look and show it. Very much like Yeoman does. Like Yeoman, do they do that as well? Yeah, cool. Sorry, before you mentioned something like a, something that can install with the CLI that was a framework with a name ending in 6 that would add the arrow syntax to JavaScript, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so it's called Babel. Babel. Yeah, so uh, as in the power, the, the tower of Babel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's weird because it's not about ES6. Uh, Sorry, uh, what, what, what is the, the this six thing? That ES6? Yeah. So um, JavaScript. Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting one. 2015. You mean ECMAScript? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. ECMAScript yes. 6. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they've, they've changed it all now. So it was being called ES6 for a very long time, and now it's JavaScript 2015. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, but, but sorry, the error syntax is something that comes with with the the, the, the browser implementing e, ES6. Mm -hmm. It's not like a a, a JavaScript uh, framework that you. So this this is the power of Babel. What Babel does is it translates your stuff that you're writing in ES6 into compatible uh, JavaScript versions. So that you can most browsers are able to run. But so you're writing it in, yeah. uh, it's compiling it. and it's transpiling it. Yeah. It yeah. is compiling it into, but it's all built into the So, so the, the, there is like a, a, a build process, like, like in C, where you have to first compile it into compatible JavaScript before being uh, executed, right? Yeah, but essentially this is the, why I said uh, Ember CLI really is a good system, because you don't have to do anything. Oh, Ember CLI right. does that for you. So you're just writing files and it's concatenating them all, it's turning them into ES5s, and when you do Ember build production, it then minifies them all, separates them into a vendor and a. I mean, yeah, I mean, so. But the thing is, you, you, you take for granted that people understand about the build process, while if you are a vanilla JavaScript programmer, as I used to be, there is no such thing as a build process for JavaScript. So I just wanted to, to, un to understand. Yeah, it's, it is something like I, I did. You're right. I did kind of take for granted that it was there. Yeah. Um, it has been a uh, a growing um, trend in JavaScript programs where you use something that would do a build process, so like Grunt or like Go. Um, there were a few other ones that kind of were coming out at the same time, but they're usually quite hard to set up. So a lot of the time, you have people who don't jump ship. Start using grunt and build process, and it's quite hard to do something like that. Um, and before Ember CLI, they had this thing called Ember AppKit, which was a grunt build to do all that for you. Right. But and that was hard on its own. And the other thing I wanted to ask you when you showed the, the first slide about the code, I, ha I was reminiscent of uh, the Knockout JS syntax or attitude, like. Uh, with this, this thing that you embedded to class uh, behaviors or something that makes things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think that Ember was influenced by Knockout.js or not? Um, well, Ember itself uh, is, you know, the history of Ember was that it was Sprite Core originally. Sorry? It was Sprite Core. Sorry. And I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, library. So I can't remember if Ember was supposed to be Spread Core 2.0 or Spread Core 3.0. It was going to be the next big thing um, in Spread Core, but it, uh, it, they changed the name and went in a different direction. But whether or not it was influenced by Knockout, 